As usual, there are a lot of great sidebar conversations going on. If, you, if you're having a great conversation, I'd ask you to take it to the hallway track so that we can start now with Mark Jones. Hello, uh, my name is Mark Jones. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation on the GDPR in FOSS today. Um, so a little bit about myself before we get started. Um, the obligatory, um, I am a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. This isn't legal advice. Um, I work for a company. I work for Civic Actions as in-house counsel and a compliance engineer. But these are my views. Um, these are not the views of my employer. Um, and a little bit about the presentation. So the GDPR is the new EU privacy law that's going to be coming into effect next May. Um, generally, there's no specific requirements that any software manufacturer has to implement in their software. So FOSS developers, I'm not here to tell you what you need to do to comply with this law. Um, so presentation over. Uh, but um, I do think the GDPR presents some opportunities for FOSS projects in terms of promoting your own project, but more importantly, promoting um, the privacy rights of yourself and your friends and neighbors. Um, and that's really what I want to talk about. Um, so why listen to this presentation? Well, I think you should listen to this presentation because if you're a FOSS developer, I have come to believe that FOSS developers in American parlance, and this is probably not the right word to use for Europeans, are basically civil libertarians. Um, so in the United States, what a civil libertarian would mean is someone who's very concerned with promoting um, individual liberties. So freedom of speech, freedom of religion, um, freedom from constraints from government control. Um, that terminology changes from country to country. Um, and I, I learned this when I was working at the Software Freedom Law Center as an attorney. I used to ask software developers, why do you care about free software? Because no one puts all of this work into creating software and giving it away for free, free in the gratis sense, unless they're doing it for a reason. Like, they must really care about something. And most of the time, what my clients and people I met at conferences would tell me is they're concerned about control. They want control over their own computer. They want to know what programs are running on their own computer. But they're doing more than that, too, because they're not just writing software for their own computer. They're writing software for other people's computers as well. And I think the other thing I noticed about free software developers, too, is they're, they're kind of obsessed with encrypting things. Um, I don't know, and you know anyone like that who might be a little obsessed with encrypting, but they, everything's better when it's encrypted. And I think everything's better when it's encrypted, mostly, and the same reason why they want control over things. They want control over who has access to their data. And it generally comes from a sense of people are concerned about privacy. So why I think people should be, uh, FOSS developers should be concerned with the GDPR is that FOSS developers aren't just concerned with control of their own computer. They're not just concerned with encrypting things. They're concerned about privacy. And I mean privacy in a broader sense. Privacy the way lo most lawyers mean about it. So, and I'm going to point to a couple documents, or one document in particular with FOSS. These are the three documents that I usually talk about when I'm trying to explain to businesses or clients what it means to be an open source license, or a free software license, or a FOSS license, or FOSS license, or whatever you want to do. Um, they're all related historically. Um, they come from one each other. So generally, you're not going to find a license that meets one of the standards for the free software definition or the Debian, so, uh, Debian uh, so, social contract or the open source definition that doesn't meet the other ones. Um, but I think the, the free software definition is probably the easiest one to explain from my point I'm trying to make here. When I tell my friends and family what I do is I help FOSS developers. I work in the field of free software. And they say, what's free software? Like shareware, the kind of things, WinZip? And I'm like, no, think of you know, this great quote, free isn't free speech, not isn't free beer which some people think, oh, that's kind of ridiculous. It's not very serious. I'm like, well, I mean, it is actually in the free software definition. That's a direct quote from them. And I think that really goes to what, what FLOSS is. It's, it's not about just writing code and giving code to other people or having your own code on your computer. It's about freedom. And I think if you look at the free software de definition, the four freedoms, which there's probably some people in this room who know these four freedoms better than I do. I know there's some people in this room who know these four freedoms better than I do. I have to go back and read them. But when I went and I looked this up, I kind of divided them into two different things. The first two are really about freedom zero, freedom to run the programs you wish for any purpose, the freedom to study how a program works and change it so that it does your computing as you wish. 
These are freedoms about how you interact with your computer, what your computer's doing with the data on your computer, right? Because computers really aren't that useful unless they're operating on data, right? So this is about how your computer is operating on your data. The second two, and this is what I think makes FOSS political and makes people civil libertarians, because it's not a selfish action. The second two are about freedoms to help other people, freedom to redistribute copies of the program so you can help your neighbor. It's explicitly in there in Freedom 2. And the freedom to distribute copies of your modified version of those programs, Freedom 3, to make that program better, to respect that person more, so they have more control over how their computer's operating and what it's doing with their data, right? It's not about telling other people what they should be doing with their data. It's about giving them the choice and the freedom to do that. So how does this relate to the GDPR? Well, first, I want to point out that privacy is more than just encryption. I think a lot of people think that privacy is about hiding your wrongs or making sure that people can't find out what you did. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an underestimates or just disservice to the value and importance of, society, uh, of privacy to society. And if you think about it from that way, authoritarian regimes are going to actually kind of win the argument about why it's OK for them to invade your privacy. So I want to point to uh, a book called Nothing to Hide by Professor Dan Solov, who's a, a law professor who specializes in privacy law in the United States. And his view about privacy is it's not just about hiding wrongs. Privacy is more than that. Privacy, vi private, violations of privacy aren't just Orwellian, where the state knows everything about you. They're Kafkaesque, because it's about what they're doing with your information, right? So it's not that just keeping the government from not watching you so they don't know everything about you, but you also want to know when you give up some of your data, when you exchange that for something else, you let something know something about uh, people know information about you, you care how that information is going to be used because it matters to you. It has an effect on you, right? You're sharing data because you want to relate to other people. You might want something from them. Maybe you're trading your, you know, biographical information for like um, free software. You can use Facebook for free. All you have to do is be the, the subject of targeted advertising. OK, well, you can do that. But you also trade information and intimate relationships too, right? You tell your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend intimate details about you because you want to establish a relationship with them. Establishing those relationships creates control over each other people's lives. And sometimes that's good, right? You want your girlfriend, or your boyfriend, or your husband, or your spouse to be able to influence you. And sometimes you want advertisers to influence you too, because you want to buy the best product. You want to find out about those good things, and that's fine. But violations of privacy, where you don't have control over how your information is being used, affects the balance of power in that relationship, right? So Dan Solov talked about it with the relationship with modern state. And that's where traditional privacy might come from, is what is the state spying on? But this is also true of corporations. How much control does a corporation have over you, in part, depends upon how much they know about you. So a simpler way to think about privacy that kind of encompasses all this instead of just secrecy is a classic American legal definition is privacy is the right to be let alone. Right? It's the right not to be bothered by other people, to have them intrude in your life. It's not just about keeping things secret. So how does this relate to the general data protection regulation? Well, you'll notice that the P in the GDPR does not stand for privacy. But I would think most privacy lawyers in the world would say that the GDPR is going to be the leading regulation or law in the world on privacy. But it's about data protection, right? Because privacy is about how data is being used, how your data is being used and your relationship to it. So I want to tell you a little bit about what it is the GDPR, uh, what does it protect, and the rules around it, and some of the basic rules or principles of the GDPR. Keep in mind, this is like a 200-page regulation. Um, so I'm not going to go into great detail. I'm just going to give you a broad overview. So what is it? Um, the Gen General Data Protection Regulation, it's going to replace the current EU regulation for privacy rules. So right now in the EU, there's a directive. And the difference between a directive and a regulation is a directive is a requirement from the EU that all of its member states in enact certain laws that meet certain requirements. So all the member states have laws internal to them that are substantially similar to other member states. And the idea being is, well, the laws are basically the same, so it makes it easier to operate or move between jurisdictions. A regulation, on the other hand, is a law that's implemented at the EU level so that in every single member state, the law is exactly the same. Well, barring the fact that it's in six different languages, and maybe that's some cause problems, but I'll leave that to an EU attorney to tell you how that works. Um, as an American, that, that confuses me. So this law doesn't come into effect until May 2018, so next year. So 
Um, you might be wondering why I'm talking about it now is because right now, all of the companies in the world that are affected by this are freaking out because they need to figure out how to comply with this law in May 2018. So they're making decisions about compliance with this law right now. The other thing to point about this regulation, why it's going to be kind of broad, um, I know I'm a technologist myself. I work with a lot of technologists. I give, them legal, I give technologists legal advice. They always want things as specific as possible. What do I have to do? GDPR doesn't tell you what you have to do. It's technology neutral. It's risk-based. So anyone here who's been in compliance or in security or privacy engineering, they probably had to go through like a risk assessment um, or an audit where they're saying like, well, I can't tell you exactly what you have to do, but these are the things you should kind of be thinking about. But you're the expert. You tell me what you have to do. The GDPR is basically listening to that methodology. I'm going to tell you why I think that's a good thing. So you can read more specifically what the GDPR is trying to do. Um, lays down rules related to protection of natural persons with uh, regard to processing of personal data and the rules related to the free movement of that personal data. Um, you can parse that a little bit more if you want, but what does it, ba what does it protect basically? Um, it applies to personal data, right? So personal data is basically anything about you or can be identified about to a particular person. And it applies to natural persons. It doesn't actually apply to dead people. So if the person's breathing, it applies to them. It doesn't apply to legal persons. They don't breathe. You've got to be breathing for this to apply to you. So this really is about protecting people's data and not corporations' data. And actually, it's a little bit broader than just computers. Um, anytime you're doing any kind of processing in an automated way or an, or an organized filing system, it applies to you. So technically, like a business's Rolodex of like clients they have, if they've gotten a traditional paper Rolodex, it applies to that as well. So there's no real, there's no escape valves really, or at least they haven't found any yet. There are a couple exceptions. I think the most important one, um, and why this doesn't really require FOSS developers generally to do anything, is uh, it doesn't apply, it doesn't regulate the use of data by natural persons and purely personal or household activity. Now, personal and household activity, we'll see how that gets defined. Underneath the old directive, it was fairly narrow. Um, but you know, if you're using data, you've got a mailing list for all your family members to send them Christmas cards. It doesn't matter how many people you're sending that, those Christmas cards to. Um, if you've got a big family, it's still personal activity. It's the kind of thing you do in your household. And of course, there are exceptions because they're still going to spy on you, right? So, but at least the, the nation states are going to be spying on you. Um, and who does it apply to? So if it doesn't apply to FOSS developers and people doing their household activities, who does it apply to? Pretty much applies to everyone else, right? So if you're a controller or a processor established in the EU, and I'll explain what those are, so you're a business in the EU, it applies to you. If you're offering goods and services in the EU, it applies to you, right? So all the big American tech companies, it applies to them. Um, or anyone else the EU applies to. And honestly, international law, not my specialty. So giving you a good, simple definition of who EU law applies to, can't really do that. But it's their catch-all, right? It's basically if you're doing any business with the EU in any way, if EU can haul you into the court, they're going to say you've got to follow this regulation. So it applies to a lot of people. Um, so basic summary, GDPR applies to everyone processing data on an EU citizen, um, unless you're doing it for personal use. So controller, these are basic words you'll find in the EU regulation. Controller is the guy who wants your data or collected the data. Processor is the guy who's actually doing things to the data. So you might have a big business, like a shoe manufacturer who doesn't run his computing facility. Shoe manufacturer is the controller. The guy he outsources sending out mailing or data mining on to is the processor. Processing, I'll show you the legal definition of that in a second. Processing is basically doing anything to data. And when I mean anything to data, I mean anything to the data. Data subject, that's you, the people who are still breathing, not the dead ones. And personal data, basically any information that could be reasonably identified about you. Um, reasonable is a key word in there. Um, we'll talk a little bit about reasonable and appropriate in a second. So these are the definitions of processing and personal data. You can see it's a very long list of verbs. Um, feel free to read that on your own time. Um, so basic rules. Um, these aren't really rules. I'm going to tell you the, the purposes and the goals of, of the GDPR, um, which I think are pretty good, right? So this goes back to what I was talking about before, about what is privacy. So, and you've, you've, if you've been in this room for the last two days like I've heard, you've heard these words too, because these things people are really concerned with, right? So one of the goals is transparency. We heard about that in the last session. Transparency, what are you doing with, well, if you're talking about a financial sponsor for a FOSS organization, what are you doing with my money? 
But if you're giving your data to someone else, what are you doing with my personal information, right? I'm going to give you my medical record. What are you going to do with that? I want to know. I want to give my doctor my medical information because I don't want him to kill me accidentally. But I don't know if I want someone to figure out that I'm like the perfect person to turn into like a cyborg. Like that's probably not things that I want them to just go experiment with. Purpose limitation, right? So like I gave you it for one purpose. Don't use it for another purpose, even if you're going to tell me. Uh, data minimization. Only, collect, only ask me for the data you actually need. Don't, don't ask for more data than you really need. Accuracy, I, you do, if you're going to do things to me, because that's what it's about, is doing things to me by processing my data, make sure you're doing it based on accurate information, right? So don't assume that I'm like, well, if you're in the United States right now, like don't assume that you're not a US citizen and deport you accidentally, which we do all the time. Um, storage limitation. Only keep the data for as long as you're actually doing it for the reason you collected it for, right? So you can't ask for it for one purpose and then do something else with it. But if you can't do something else with it and you fulfilled that purpose, it's time to get rid of it. Um, and integrity and confidentiality. So this is kind of where encryption falls in. Um, and you have to use appropriate and technical and organizational means to protect the data. Um, if any of you are academics here, like there are some exceptions for research there. So don't think this is like going to shut down research for social services or healthcare or anything like that. Um, they're not going to let that happen. So, but I want to talk a little bit about appropriate and reasonable because this kind of goes into why I think FOSS developers care. So, uh, quick search of the GDPR text. The word appropriate is used 80 times in the implementing rules and over 110 times in the entire text. Uh, and the word reasonable is only used 10 times. I'm pretty sure if it were written by an American attorney, they use the word reasonable a heck of a lot more. Um, and because I'm an American attorney, I'm going to kind of make the assumption that appropriate and reasonable mean similar to the same thing. I don't know if that's a good assumption. If there's anyone who practices EU and American law and can tell me this is a terrible uh, assumption, let me know. No, it's a terrible assumption, I'm sure. <laughs> no. So um, this is one of my favorite cases uh, in US law. Um, and it gives you a short, succinct definition of what reasonable or appropriate actions are. Um, I will not read you the whole thing, but basically it's defining um, when you have a, a reasonable thing to do is when the burden is less than the probability of an injury occurring. So B less than P times L, right? So mathematical terms, everyone here now understands what they're supposed to do, right? Reasonable things, when the burden is less than the probability of the injury occurring. That is not any definition of reasonable that is common in Europe. <laughs> But in the UK, they use uh, on the balance of probabilities, which goes uh, hand in hand with us. Yes, and reasonable. Reasonable has a connotation of objective. Of anyone else would objectively choose the same thing. That is more a, a typical term of reasonable. Okay. Uh, my understanding of the word appropriate is it's listening to best practices in the industry. So it is actually kind of similar in the larger ambiguities of American law. I'm sure they're not exactly analogous, but um, for this audience, I think they're probably close enough. Um, maybe not for a legal audience. So um, the GDPR, some of the things that it points out that are appropriate measures. Um, they might include these, right? These are not always required in every case. They might be required sometimes. Pseudonymization or encryption of the personal data, if it's appropriate. Ensure confidentiality, integrity, and availability, right? So just do that. Just ensure it. Um, ability to restore access to personal data in a timely manner. Just make sure that's done. You don't have any problems figuring out what's required there if you're technologist. You just do that. Um, and process for regularly testing and evaluating the effectiveness of these controls. That's also easy to do. Anyone who's a systems administrator in the room can just go down this list and check them off, I'm sure, right? I mean, these are pretty broad standards. It's basically not telling you how to do this at all. Um, but I think a couple important things about the GDPR is the controller is responsible for demonstrating compliance with uh, the GDPR, right? So they're accountable and they have to show that they're accountable. So it's not about prove that I didn't follow these rules. It's telling corporations, you need to prove that you're following these rules, which puts a big onus on them because it's not about what can I do to get away with this. It's like, what do I need to do to show that I'm not going to get in trouble? A couple other things I want to point out about this is that um, when you're processing data, you've got to have a lawful reason for doing that. And uh, my experience, at least amongst American attorneys who are discussing the GDPR, the main reason they're looking for is the data subject has consent. Now, it's not the only reason that they might be processing your data. I think there's seven or eight le legitimate reasons for processing data. But they're telling corporations, if you can find a way to ground your processing in consent, this is the safest one. 
because the other ones you're probably going to get some pushback on. So consent and affirmative consent is what they mean here is going to be a big deal in this regulation. So why should FOSS developers care about this regulation? So I can think of three main reasons. Uh, Self-promotion is one of them, right? So if you're making FOSS software that's used by corporations in the EU, they're all freaking out right now about how to comply with the GDPR. They're going to be very concerned with, well, if I use your FOSS software, does it help me or hurt me when it complies with the GDPR, right? So it's about transparency and accountability um, and knowing what the processing is going on there. Like, what does your software do? What does it collect? Those are things you're going to be concerned with. Um, but I think the more important ones for people in this room, because I do think that FOSS developers are civil libertarians in the American sense. They care about other people's privacy. It's, can we use the GDPR to strengthen privacy rights for ourselves and our friends? Um, and does the GDPR present any opportunities that FOSS developers might want to take advantage of that corporations probably weren't volunteering before? So here's a list of the things just going through the GDPR that I think a lot of corporations are going to be going to their IT department saying, hey, just you know, implement all this stuff. Um, I don't think these are all things that FOSS is, I don't think FOSS is responsible for doing any of these things. I don't even think some of them are really relevant. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that because this isn't a compliance talk. That's for corporations. Um, and I'm not here to tell you that FOSS developers have a responsibility to help corporations save money by doing their work for them. What I think is more important is to look at that list and say, which one of those will actually strengthen pri privacy rights? So I think FOSS developers have an opportunity to help define what is appropriate. So if you ask a corporation, well, what can you do to, pri uh, to protect someone's privacy? What are the appropriate steps you need to do to ensure confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data? They're going to do the math and say, like, well, you know, how much is it going to cost me if I violate this regulation? How much is it going to cost me to implement this protection? And they're going to figure out the cheapest way for them to comply with the rule, right? That's their motivation is to make the money, which is fine. That's what corporations are supposed to do. FOSS developers, on the other hand, might want to ask a different question, right? So when it comes to the appropriate means for protecting data, they might want to say, well, what's actually practical for protecting people's privacy? They're not asking, though, well, how much is it going to cost? They might ask the practical question of, like, well, it might cost a little bit more, but it gives us better protection. It's, you know, I'm not worried about the fine so much is, like, if I were trusting my data with someone else, this is what I would hope they would do for me. If I were trusting uh, holding my sister's data, how much effort would I would put into protecting my sister's data? So it's a chance to define appropriate, which really is about raising the bar on what privacy protections exist. Right? So if the FOSS community can do this, it's going to end up influencing corporations or has the possibility of influencing corporations in two ways. One, well, the FOSS community makes a lot of software, and a lot of that software gets used by corporations. Right? So if you're building software that's already respecting people's privacy and, it go, and a corporation chooses to use it, you're now helping their customers that they're interacting with or the people they're holding data on. The other thing is, is if they don't like that, they don't like that raised bar that you put into your software, they could change it, right? They're free to do that. FOSS lets them do that. But now they need to explain to a regulator why they remove some privacy protection, right? Um, the other thing is, is that by creating a community standard, we can create expectations amongst users and set an example for regulators, right? So even if they're not using FOSS software, they might say, well, you know, that's great that you have a blogging service over there, um, but you, and you're saying it's too complicated to get the data out of it so someone can move to another blogging service because, you know, it's a vast network of friendship relationships you're tracking. But here are these guys over here who don't get paid. They do this on the weekend. Um, and they're able to exchange data from their platform to another platform. And they manage to preserve all those things. If you make a billion dollars a year off of making a blogging platform, I don't understand why they were able to do it and you couldn't. I mean, do you not have enough money to pay for people's weekends? Is that the problem? Um, the other thing is creating expectations for users, right? So you know, this is an opportunity to show users FOSS actually does respect you. I hear that a lot. Use software that respects the user. Like, well, let's respect them in more than just giving them control over their computer, but let's create software that helps respect users' data even when they don't have the compute that software on their own device. So uh, here's the long list of things that uh, is going through there. Um, these are some that I think are particularly relevant to uh, FOSS developers. And I just want to go through a little bit, uh, talk a little about what I think projects could do, if it's applicable to you, that would make a difference. Um, obviously, I'm talking in very general terms. It's going to depend from project to project. But 
consent must be affirmative, I think, is probably an easy one. So part of the new regulations is it's codifying that when you give consent, it's got to be an affirmative action. So what's an affirmative action? So when you go to a website and you're about to sign up for that service, and they're going to collect data about you, they're going to give you a long, un un well, they used to be, it'll give you a long, un understandable description of what they're going to do with all that data. And the box would already be checked, and you could just hit OK. At least that's how it still is in America, and probably will stay that in America. I signed a contract the other day where if you read it, um, you could find embedded inside of the paragraph, there was a checkbox pre-checked that said, I waived my rights to file a class action. Um, and as long as you were willing to go to like the 20th page and look in the middle of a paragraph in text that was smaller, you could find the checkbox pre-checked. Um, it's not really affirmative consent if you hit I agree to that agreement that you also affirmatively consented to agree to waive your right to class action. Sure, there was a checkbox I could have unchecked, but I had to find it, right? So if you're building FOSS software, where people are signing up and agreeing to certain terms of services, or if you're building a module FOSS software where they, they're adding in like the ability to agree to certain terms, just make it real easy. Just make that box, the agree, I agree box, unchecked by default, right? That's all you have to do. Um, now a corporation that's going to use that perhaps unmodified, because a lot of smaller companies do, they don't have to go through and find that. They're going to say, no, I didn't agree to it in the first place, right? Like, that's the way it should be by default, so do that. The other thing you can do related to this, too, is make it easy to opt out of processes. So if you've got a piece of software that performs multiple different functions, um, can you make it so that a user of that software has the ability to opt out of some part of that process that doesn't break the whole product? Um, so if you're going to have, someone might sign up for like a user forum. Um, and that forum might also have like social networking features as well so people can find them. Well, they might want to have access to the forum, but they don't want to publish their user data, right? So let them turn off the, the ability to have it listed in a directory or some kind of social networking forum, but let them still access the directory. Give them that option. Build that into your software. Architect your software so that they can choose which parts they're actually going to use. Pseudonymization and minimization when possible. Uh, I don't know how much this applies to FOSS directly, although I'm sure it's out there. None of the projects that I've dealt with directly, but I certainly see it working in-house in when we bring software in. Developers seem to collect all the data they possibly can on a user registration form. So whenever you have a user registering your software, you have to, and I know this is absolutely mandatory, you have to ask for their Twitter handle. I don't know why. Um, it's very uncommon that I see people may actually ever have that integration with Twitter, but we've got that Twitter handle data just in case we decide to use it later. And then even when I go back and I ask them, because I'm filing out a privacy impact assessment, I said, well, do we ever use the Twitter handle for anything? They're like, well, no, not really. And I'm like, well, what do you mean by use? I'm like, well, do you ever like display it or allow people to search on it or interact with Twitter? I'm like, well, I mean, technically we display it when people go to look at their own account information. So that's a use, right? I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, I guess the way I just define use for you, that, that is a use because you are displaying it. But I, I don't think it's a useful use. We don't need to tell the person we asked their Twitter handle what it was, what their Twitter handle is, and then do nothing else with it. It's not necessary to have it. It presents a risk to that user. If your software ever gets hacked in their installation, there's just more data that was collected for literally no reason. This happens all the time. So just don't ask for that information if you're not actually going to use it. Have a reason. Um, Right to access or review processing of data at any time. So if you are building software that acts automatically on other people's data, um, perhaps the, the sends out, you know, you sign up for some kind of process, uh, discussion forum, we keep going back to this as an example. You also have a mailing list feature on it. Make it easy for people who are in your system to find out what you did with their system, right? So most servers now have got audit logs that are built into it. A lot of them are going to keep track of when you send outgoing emails, especially if it's for some kind of marketing campaign. Um, and I know there's FOSS software out there that helps you deal with this. And the people who are sending out those emails want to know if other people read them, or at least that the emails were sent. If for no other reason you want to know you sent this person an email yesterday, when you run that cron job tonight, don't send it to them again. So we've got that data there. But do you let the person who received that email know that you sent them that, that email? Like, make it easy for them to see what you did with their data. I'm like, OK, I signed up for this discussion forum, and I keep getting emails. And you know, I think it comes from this company. Can I go and see? Oh, yeah, look, they're actually sending me emails. They send me emails every two weeks. Let them know what you're actually doing with their data. 
Now again, this is going to be context specific, right? So you've got to think about it in the context of your FOSS software of how does my, my program process data? What can I let people opt in and out of? And when I'm processing it, is there some way that I can make that information by default accessible to the people whose information is being held inside the software? Um, these three, I think, are all kind of the same. I'm sure everyone in the room has heard of the right to be forgotten. Even people in the United States know about the right to be forgotten because it made a big splash a couple of years ago. Um, the right to be forgotten is going to be codified in the GDPR. It is codified in the GDPR. But along with that is the right to update incorrect data for free and the right to um, have the data only stored for a limited period of time. Right. So I mentioned this to some of my friends or some of my coworkers at the company I work at who are big into Drupal. And I said, you know, so for example, right to have your data deleted. If someone goes into your blogging software or community software and says, give them the option to delete their own account, because why not, right? It, you gave them the option to make their own account. Maybe they want to leave the community. Give them the option to delete the account. And when you, you give them the option to delete the account, actually delete the account. And the response I got back from one of the Drupal contributors was like, oh, yeah, I think we had a Drupal ticket open for a couple years um, about how you couldn't actually delete your account. It wouldn't work. And I'm like, right, you could prioritize that, right? If, we res if we're writing software because we respect other people's freedoms, we respect their right of privacy and how their data is going to be handled, then prioritize the delete option for their account so that they have the option of removing their personal data from their system. Now, you might think, well, you know, if you're building a discussion forum, I don't want to interrupt that thread. Like, are they going to be able to remove all of their discussion comments? Well, this is a contextual thing, too, right? So the right to be forgotten case that established this sued Google. Google was determined, like, no, you can't actually make the, the, the link to the newspaper article accessible to everyone, at least that easily. But the newspaper that wrote the article, they don't have to go back and delete that article because it's a different context. Is it relevant to your service that that data still exists? It's not relevant 10 years on that make Google make that the first search result for this person who followed the lawsuit. But the, article, the newspaper that wrote the article, on the other hand, probably has an interest in preserving the integrity of their archive of what their newspaper looked like that day. right? So, when you're looking at your software, you might want to make that choice of if you've got a discussion forum, is there some way that I could just, maybe I could just remove their name but leave their comment? Or could you remove their comment and then just put a note there that says it was removed? If any of you are Reddit users, I think you will know, you will have noticed at some point in time that there are comments on there where there's no name associated with it or it's a throwaway account. It's kind of the culture on Reddit. Um, but you will also see in conversation threads where comments have just been removed, either because someone deleted it or because a moderator removed it. It doesn't actually hurt the conversation that much. You might kind of wonder what that was right now, but it's possible, so think about that. And then if you're really concerned with strengthening people's privacy rights, maybe you want to be pretty kind of aggressive about that. If the person who gets your software wants to say, well, you know, I kind of want to hold on to this data a little bit more, I'm not as concerned with privacy rights. I think I've got a reason. The onus could be on them to hold on to the data, right? The default could be, no, we're going to get rid of your data. If you want to use my software for free, the defaults I'm sending you is where we remove data when people ask for it. So there's a couple of opportunities, too, that I think the GDPR also creates. Uh, the right to data portability and the right to data export to common format. This is actually, when I was reading the GDPR, this is the thing that kind of um, inspired me to say, oh, this is something I should tell people about. Because the word common format, I was interested in what that means. And I don't, I don't know if there's someone who knows what that means exactly or if there's an established body of law on that. Um, but it's not use an international standard, right? Um, it's a commonly used machine readable format. So if anyone here has tried to process a Word doc uh, file format before docx came out, I would probably want to say, like, well, that's probably not something we generally commonly use machine readable format. I guess technically Microsoft could do it, right? And then they came out with docx. Um, and I don't know if that actually meets this standard either, because the only software I know that can parse docx is still Word. But ODT exists. Um, so maybe that's a commonly used machine readable format. Or maybe it's a YAML file or CSV files. It kind of depends upon this. But this isn't just about Word documents, right? This is about all software you're operating on personal data, right? So Facebook, um, at least in the Schrems case, Max Schrems, who kind of invalidated the EU uh, relation, data sharing relationship with the United States, when he asked for his data from Facebook, he got something like 50 pages of PDFs of his Facebook account. That was all the data he had on him. 
I don't think anyone's going to seriously contend that a PDF file is a commonly used machine readable format for like a blogging network that maintains social relationships, right? How easy is it going to be for him to ask a computer to reconstruct his social relationships with friends that he had stored in Facebook by parsing a PDF file? I'm like, it's going to be kind of a challenge, right? So this standard doesn't exist. The other thing that they're asking here is that it's going to be an expectation that controllers, remember these are the corporations that are collecting your data, allow you to move data between controllers directly, right? So it's not about you have to export the data onto your computer, which I know Google allows you to do now. And then if you can find someone else that happens to parse our file format, you can import it into them. But they want you to be able to move data directly, right? So if you want to go from Facebook to Google Buzz or Google Plus, whatever it's called now, um, you should be able to do that, right? So, but that's not a standard that exists right now. So here's the two opportunities that I think this creates for FOSS. One, if you're able to export your blog from Drupal and import it into Joomla and bring it over to WordPress, that looks like a commonly used machine readable format to me, right? And if you're able to export your, your blog, because I think that's basically what Facebook and Google Buzz are, and you're able to export that out into your local computer and re-import it only into Facebook, I'm not sure that they can make a good argument at that point of, well, it's a commonly used machine readable format. Because the plaintiff can always say in that case, like, well, I can move between all of these blogging software, but I can't move between Facebook and anyone else. Or if I can move between all these different FOSS softwares and I can only move between Facebook and Google, which one's the commonly used machine readable format? Now, I'm not saying you're going to win that case. Maybe the judge, the lawyer in that case will be persuaded. As long as you can move between the most two popular platforms, that's fine. But there's a heck of a lot better chance of forcing Facebook and Google to actually give people's data back and let them move their data to where they want it to go if the community is building a standard that they have to meet. And if we wait to play catch up, I'm pretty sure Google and Facebook are not going to make it as easy to parse their data. It's going to be one of those situations where how easy it is to parse a docx format file. Sure, it's possible, but is it going to show up commonly in FOSS software? So I think I've got a little bit of time for questions. Thanks. So, so this regulation um, that you've just talked about, does it only apply to EU citizens? So the regulation applies to controllers who are collecting data on EU and EU subjects. Like, can we have a situation where, like, at the moment, there is about 900 companies in the world on both sides of the Atlantic that are collecting stuff unknown to you people about things that people do online. Yeah. So, can we have a situation and kind of a loophole where European companies can do that on U.S. citizens, while U.S. companies can do that on EU citizens? Uh, so the question was, is there a loophole where EU uh, United States companies can do this to EU citizens and EU companies can do it to American citizens? Um, so um, the, common, the more common case that people are worried about is American companies doing this to EU citizens. So the GDPR is actually a regulation about not just processing of data, but the transfer of data too. So you're not allowed to transfer data outside of the EU unless you're complying with these rules. Um, and it also applies to companies doing business in the EU, right? So you can't collect data on EU citizens and then transfer it to the US to do whatever you want. Um, if you do that, you need to have some legal mechanism in place that the EU has approved that allows that transfer. Um, there's a couple of different agreements in place for that. But basically, they take the EU rules and force them on the companies even when they're operating outside the EU jurisdiction. So the one with the United States that's in place right now is Privacy Shield. The one that was in place two years ago was called the um, Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor was invalidated because they found that the protection provided in the United States weren't actually adequate. Um, so the EU actually does have uh, data protection authorities who are interested in preventing that uh, loophole from occurring. Hello, I'm Federico from Wikimedia Italy. Um, two very concrete examples. Do you think that uh, um, an organization like the Wikimedia Foundation which runs Wikipedia should try to apply these sort of standards for its users. And 
even though perhaps it's not legally uh, forced to. And second, do you think that, um, for instance, uh, web server software like Apache or NGX should change their practice, um, their defaults for things like storing IP addresses in uh, web server logs? Uh, so the first question was, do you think, do I think that the uh, Wikimedia Foundation that runs Wikipedia should comply with this rule even if it doesn't apply to them? Um, my recommendation would be to them is, I'm not your lawyer, but you should ask your lawyer if this does apply to you, because it's not clear to me whether or not the EU law applies to them. Um, maybe an EU attorney could tell them that. Basically, there's also a journalism exception, and that for the most part would apply to most of the stuff Wikimedia does, but Wikimedia does have legal people on the ground here. So apart from the private use exception, journalism is generally not covered by the GDPR because there's an overriding freedom of expression interest there. Uh, this is overly simplified, by the way. It is not that, it's always, it depends, etc. Right. So, and, and to get to the question after that, the publisher of software is not necessarily the data processor. So the idea of privacy by default, for example, putting do not track by default on in Apache is not necessarily the responsibility of the Apache Foundation. But anyone who rolls out Apache in real life should, on a GDPR, consider it. Consider it turning on do not track and re reduce the logging to the minimum so possible. If, if the question is about what they should do as, a, as an interest of promoting privacy, um, right now, when I configure an Apache server, I usually choose between combined and what's the other log, uh, web server log common. Um, you know, maybe they want to come up with a, a new default option for choosing for logging standards that doesn't include IP address or something like that. So very briefly, I'm working in that domain for one of the European Data Protection Authorities. I'm happy to take questions offline, but I wanted to clarify one point on the territorial uh, scope of the regulation, because it applies to all entities that process data in the EU, regardless of who are the persons concerned. There's no limitation to EU citizens. So when the, your company is here or your organization is here, they are subject to it, even if the people are Americans. So that, that would be uh, covered in, in any case. So that's just a simple explanation. We just have time for two more questions. How is Europe uh, planning to execute that law? Are they doing audits or something uh, like that? So my understanding of the, and this, I'm do not understand the European regulatory process in general because the EU is still kind of a bureaucratic mystery to me, so um, ask a European attorney. But um, each, each member state still is going to have a regulatory authority, um, which companies are going to be, um, to some extent at least, choose which member state's uh, data protection authority they want to be regulated by. Um, but the idea is that the rules are supposed to be uniform, so you shouldn't be able to forum shop by going to the forum that interprets the rules more laxly. How that actually occurs in the EU, um, as an American attorney, that kind of confuses me because in America we would actually kind of encourage, the, as the structure of our system kind of encourages forum shopping. So um, it's not something I exactly understand how that'll work. Hi. Um, just to, not really question, just two comments about your uh, presentation. Um, first, it's uh, maybe you haven't mentioned, but all the practice that you recommend, and that I think uh, some of them is quite good, um, can be summarized uh, under the concept of uh, privacy by design. That is uh, the idea that uh, um, when you design a software, uh, you should, uh, in the process of designing this software, in, so in the process of coding it, uh, have uh, in mind uh, the GDPR, so the um, protecting the privacy of your users, your intended users, and make sure that everything is uh, uh, following this uh, state of mind. So for example, anonymizing when possible, and so on and so on. Um, and second comment. Um, about the question of uh, how to apply this, that, that's still a, of, that's still a big question among lawyers, of course, and technicians in uh, EU um, 
uh, in EU uh, member states. Uh, but one of the things is um, uh, the idea to have a privacy impact assessment, and that is a risk-based ap approach. You didn't um, uh, detail uh, this approach, but mainly what does it mean? It means that uh, when you when you uh, design your software uh, before design uh, before designing of course you need to uh, ensure that every good practice for protecting privacy is um, is uh, but also the risk uh, that is minimized so what is the risk for users that use your software to to be subject to a violation of privacy for example if uh, if you forget to make anonymization for some personal data, of course this kind of uh, practice will will uh, higher the level of risk for your users. And of course, it, do, it doesn't um, it's not very compatible with uh, the idea of privacy by design. Thank you. I apologize. We're, we're out of time. I know there are more questions for Mark. Maybe, Mark, if you'd be willing to step into the hallway, people could continue to ask you questions. Thank you very much.